Do you wish you had your own private tutor to help you study for the Certified Water Technologist examination? Well, now you do. So many of you have asked me to help you with the mock CWT examination, and I've done that very thing. If you go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep, again, that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep, you will see that I've created a course and I tell you everything I know about each one of those mock questions. It's my hope that that helps give you the confidence you need to sign up to get certified today. Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm your host, Trace Blackmore. Welcome to another episode of the Scaling Up H2O podcast. And nation, happy World Water Day. We've been celebrating World Water Day since 1993. And the theme today is about groundwater making the invisible visible. Groundwater is invisible, but its impact is visible everywhere. Out of sight, under our feet, groundwater is a hidden treasure that enhances our lives. Almost all of the liquid fresh water in the world is groundwater. As climate change gets worse, groundwater will become more and more crucial. We need to work together to sustainably manage this precious resource. Groundwater is out of sight, but it must not be out of mind. Happy World Water Day, and while you're out servicing your accounts, talking to your clients, why not talk about this valuable resource that we have, we're so fortunate to have a job in, which is water. And today we're going to interview somebody that's going to have us look at water a lot differently than we are used to on our regular day to day. But before we get to that interview, Nation, next week I will be at the Association of Water Technologies Technical Training Seminars in Cleveland, Ohio. This is one of my favorite events to participate in. I'm one of the trainers. I get the fortune to do sales training, to do the fundamentals and applications training, and then also teach people about water treatment math. It is my Super Bowl of being in the water treatment industry. I saw a bunch of people back in Seattle just a few weeks ago. Well, we're going to be in Cleveland just next week. So there's still time to sign up. If you have not registered, you can go to awt.org or you can go to our show notes page. Both of those places will lead you to the right place so you can register. And if you are there, please, please say hi to me. I want to hear your story and I definitely want to meet you. Be sure to go to our show notes page to learn about all the events that are happening. Maybe one is near you. Maybe one is one that will get you supercharged on the next thing that you want to learn about. Nation, as always, we are thinking on water, especially on World Water Day. Here's James to help us out with that. Welcome to Thinking on Water with James, the segment where we don't give you the answers, we give you the topics and questions for you to think about, drop by drop. Now let's get to it. In this week's episode, we're thinking about how saturated brine is then diluted during the softener regeneration brine draw cycle. Why is this? On the surface, it seems oxymoronic to work so hard to achieve a saturated brine in the brine tank only to dilute it during the brine draw cycle in the regeneration process. What impact would using saturated brine have on the resin beads? Operationally, why does it make sense to dilute instead of achieving the desired brine concentration up front? You've probably not even thought much about this one part of the softener regeneration process before. But take this week to think about it and the entire process. Be sure to follow hashtag TOW22 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O to share your thoughts on each week's Thinking on Water. I'm James McDonald, and I look forward to learning more from you. 
Scout Nation, I'm really excited to talk with our guest today. Here's our interview. My lab partner today is Steve Spear of Team World Vision. Steve, welcome to the Scaling Up H2O podcast. Well, thanks, Trace. This is, uh, this is fantastic being with you all. Yeah, I'm so excited about today's interview. I just recently learned a little over a year ago about what you all do, and I had the privilege of meeting you personally this past December. So we're going to talk about all things Team World Vision, but I want to talk about you first because you're a very impressive guy. You have a, a really interesting resume, some of the things that you've done. So do you mind telling the Scaling Up Nation a bit about yourself? Well, sure. I'm, I'm happy to. And again, thank you for having me and Scaling Up Nation. This is just awesome being with you all. My name is Steve Spear. I live in the Chicagoland area. I've been, lived here for about 30 years. My wife, Frances, and I are coming up on, gosh, about 36 years of, of marriage. Uh, this June, we have a couple of children, one grandson, love being a grandparent, works a little bit in the business sector and a lot of time sort of in the church sector, if you will, and then in the, now in the nonprofit sector. So yeah, kind of a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And something you shared with me when we met in December was you're not just a runner, you're a cross country, literally a cross country runner. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Probably um, when somebody hears cross country, they think, oh, somebody that ran cross country in high school or college, that kind of thing, which I, by the way, didn't do. But uh, in 2013, I ran across the United States. And there's obviously, without a doubt, a huge backstory. A person usually doesn't just wake up and go, oh, I think I'm going to run. I think I'm going to run from like the West Coast to the East Coast. There's a huge backstory behind it. And I'm quite honestly the most unlikely person on the planet to have done it. But that being said, in 2013, I did um, do, uh, do that run across the United States. And it was quite, quite a journey. Now, I have to ask, did you wake up one morning and say, this needs to get checked off my bucket list? <laughs> No, not at all. Um, you know, I had prior to 2007, I was a complete non-runner. I didn't run, hated running, wanted nothing to do with running. And a friend of mine in, in 2006 actually ran the Chicago Marathon and did it with World Vision. It was kind of a fundraising opportunity for clean water. And he did it. And it was the very first year that Team World Vision had a team at a marathon. And it was a new kind of a new startup within the greater family of World Vision. But my buddy did it. The next day he said, oh, you need to run this with me next year in 2007. You need to run the Chicago Marathon. And Trace, I had a two-letter answer for him, which was N-O. <laughs> um, and it was followed by the phrase, I hate running. But over time, I felt compelled to step out of my comfort zone and to try this, to do this. So I did. I ran in 2007, my very first Chicago Marathon. And I actually had four goals for my first marathon. My goal number one was just to hate running less every time I ran. Goal number two was to train well enough to make it to the starting line. The third goal was to finish before they closed the course. So I didn't really have high goals at all. And then the last goal was to raise $1,000 for clean water for the most vulnerable in the world. And to my surprise, something transformative happened in me. And that sort of just led me on a journey which then about five years later is when through a series of events, the decision came based upon a prompting to do a run across the United States. Now, tell us about that, because obviously you didn't wake up one morning and said, today's the day I'm going to start in California. I'm going to end in New York. What was that journey like? Yeah. I mean, once the moment landed, like after kind of like, um, running from the, I quote, no, no pun intended, after running from the idea of doing this and finally surrendering myself to do it, that was in April of 2012 is when I kind of finally said, okay, this is going to happen. My wife and I kind of got on the same page. Okay, let's, let's do this. I would run. And she was obviously the number one cheerleader and support of the whole thing. It became uh, kind of a process. So I ended up, re I was on staff at a, a fairly uh, large church here in the Chicago area. I resigned my position and it ended up being an 18-month volunteer project for World Vision. So I was a volunteer for the organization when I did the run. The run itself lasted five months. I ran about a marathon a day for 150 days straight. But it ended up being an 18-month project because there was the, the planning, 
ahead of the run, you know, to, to for all the logistics and all of that. And then, the, of course, the run itself. And then the, you know, it was about, I think we took three months after the run to kind of kind of settle things a little bit before figuring out what the next step of life was going to be. But the, the actual run itself was five months. The stuff on either side of it was just more kind of logistic ramp up and logistic kind of rundown. It was definitely something, a period of time we'll never forget. So you shared some of your stats with me. It, it says you started on April 8th of 2013 and you ended on September 6th of 2013. You ran 3,081 miles through 14 states, went through 10 pairs of running shoes and ate over a thousand peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Okay, I got to know about the shoes and the sandwiches. How do you break in all of those shoes so they don't kill you on the race? Yeah, interestingly, you know, I think when you get used to a really uh, a pair of running shoes that fit you like a glove, you can just throw on a new pair and you're just ready to rock and roll. So I, I kind of knew exactly the kind of shoe that I needed. And Asics was very kind to us. They were one of our product sponsors, which was great. And uh, so we're very, very happy with that. And then, so yeah. There, each shoe kind of has a story. I, obviously, I still have all 10 pairs of shoes and each one of them have a story uh, for sure. And then yeah, the, the peanut butter and jellies were, uh, you know, I had uh, so many food items that, w- that became cravings along the way. And But peanut butter and jelly, and those were like, we figured I ate about a thousand of those mid-run. Uh, those were like the stable. The P- PB&Js, God bless them. They were the stable <laughs> food. Lots of other things that were highlight foods for me as well, but PB and J's were like a lot of fun. So it says here roughly about a 5,000 calorie a day diet. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. How many calories a day were you burning? Well, it's interesting how the body acclimates. We had two physicians that were really kind to us along the way, uh, both a, just a general physician and then a orthopedic surgeon physician. And, you know, my body, we figured I probably, you know, I was probably, I should have been burning five to 6,000 calories a day, but my, your body just regulates after a little bit of time. It was hard to actually take in. I would try to five to 6,000 calories. Many times I couldn't quite get that in. You know, I ended up losing about 17 or 18 pounds from beginning to end of the run. Um, so I definitely wasn't keeping up as much as, you know, we would have liked, but it was enough to kind of keep me moving. Would you do it again? <laughs> yeah, you know, oddly, you know, I don't know. I hope my wife isn't listening to this. I know I'm kidding. Um, it would be intriguing because, you know, when you do something once, Trace, you kind of you learn so much the first time around, whatever it is, all of us do things for the first time. You go, oh, man, all these learnings. So th- it would be intriguing to think about doing it again, whether or not life and space would allow for it. And would our family dynamic, you know, be at the place where we want to do it again. But it would be intriguing since you did it once. <laughs> So you ended your run at Battery Park overlooking the Statue of Liberty. What was that moment like? You're finally coming to the end. The Statue of Liberty is coming into focus. You can't run anymore. Otherwise, you're going to get wet. What was it like? Right. Yeah, there was it was just a tremendous sense of gratitude and gratefulness. You know, we I'm a person of faith. And so, you know, there was a lot of prayers that had been offered for me and for protection. And then the, the, the run itself uh, raised over a half a million dollars for clean water. And so there's a lot of thankfulness of the provisions, both, both monetarily, but provisions in so many different other ways as well. So I think when I got to Battery Park, there was just this overwhelming sense of gratefulness uh, and an overwhelming sense of like, almost like humility of like, wow, this, this did occur. And, and this was like, not about me. It was about what so many others had done to make it happen. So, you know, it was, it was fairly, it felt good. It's so interesting. Each day that I ran, my body was acclimated to run anywhere between 25 and 40 miles average a marathon a day. But there were some days I would do like a non-running day. So the closing day of the run uh, ended up being like an 18 mile run. And so when I got to the end, my body was like, well, you still got some more to do. Like you're not done yet. It was kind of weird. Like it was this great sense of like, I'm done. But it's like, it wasn't like one of these thoughts where like I came and lunged myself for the finish line. It was like, oh, this my, it, it had become semi-normal to do this, but I was really glad to stop. <laughs> I bet. Was there ever a moment in the cross-country trek where you said, I can't do this? Yeah, there, there, there definitely were quite a few moments where there was a lot of doubt, for sure. Uh, lots of different challenges, multiple, multiple challenges. Uh, there was one particular day 
I caught the flu in Oklahoma, lost a few days off the run schedule. And I kind of this personal desire to, to run to Chicago. We had fundraising activities in Chicago. What I didn't want to do is like, you know, uh, be in Southern Illinois and then have to drive to Chicago because I lost some days off the run schedule and then speak and then come back, you know, down to Southern Illinois and have to run that distance again. So it became very important for me to make up days. So I ended up, and it was the third week in July, 2013. And I did way better than seven marathons in seven days. I, I think it was like nine or 10. I really scaled up my running every day. But five of the seven days that week, the heat index was 115 plus. And on one particular day, I finished the end of it. It was like the third or fourth day of that week. And I finished in some parking lot of a you know construction company along Interstate 55. I was completely trashed and done, Trace. And I sat down in a chair that our crew had put out for me. And I was just, I was done. And my wife sat down next to me. She sat on the ground. I was sitting in the chair. And I just kind of, with like tons of tears rolling down my face out of just pure exhaustion, I said, I, I do believe I'm done. I could not even envision waking up another day and doing another day. I just couldn't. And my wife very graciously sat there for what felt to be like five or 10 minutes just in quiet. And then she spoke and she said, she said, babe, I, I do believe God is going to resupply your energy tomorrow. I think you just have to trust in that. And I didn't even have the strength to believe her, disbelieve her, argue with her, agree. I just didn't. And the next day, the strength was there. And so that was definitely the, the one poignant day I wanted to call it quits. So it was a memorable day. Well, thanks for sharing all that with us. Let's get into what World Vision is. What exactly do they do? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, So World Vision, we happen to be the largest Christian humanitarian organization on the planet. So we began, um, officially began in 1950. Uh, So we've been, you know, at this for about 70 years. We're in 100 countries. And, you know, our goal in the name of Christ is to serve the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable children. We have, you know, part of our ethos is to bring and see fullness of life for every child and the will to make it so. And so we have a, at the core of who we are, we want to uh, see communities lifted out of poverty for good. And so that's sort of the short take of who we are. And, and like I said, we, we are in 100 countries. Um, we have about almost 40,000 staff worldwide. We have about 800 here in the United States that are domestic, mainly fundraisers, you know, people that are raising the awareness of what we do and raising the awareness of global poverty. The majority of our our, our staff, if you will, are all indigenous to the countries that we serve. So if we have, you know, a couple thousand staff that serve in the country of Kenya, for example, they are indigenous Kenyans to Kenya. And so the work that we do on the ground is done indigenously at its core, that really aids to the sustainability of what we do to lift communities out of poverty for good. So many of us are so fortunate. We turn on the faucet and there comes out clean, clear, drinkable water. We don't ever think about it. You are talking to the industrial water treatment community. What do you want them to know about the world water crisis? Well, for one, thank you, Scaling Up Community, for just being a part of just what you do with water. Because in Kenya, for example, in many African countries, there's a phrase which I know probably all of you are quite familiar with, water is life. And, you know, we, again, you just said it, Trace, sometimes we take it very for granted domestically here. I think the average individual uses about 70 to 80 gallons of water here domestically to you know, whether you wash dishes over the course of the day, take a shower, you know, wash a load of laundry, what have you, flush the toilet. And, you know, that's, we just, we do take it for granted. And whenever your water's been shut off, I don't know the last time your water got shut off or you've been without water, all of a sudden you realize, oh, okay, this is a pretty big deal. You know, obviously in the developing world, we know the lack of clean drinking water. It's the number one preventable cause of death on the planet. Again, we can lower deaths on the, on the planet through just the provision of clean drinking water. And so that which we work in every day, those of you listening, that very subject matter in the developing world, as you know, when it's provisions are made for it and all of a sudden, you know, children and mainly women and women and children who are the main water carriers in the developing world, when they're not pulling water out of 
you know, contaminated water sources. And by doing so, they're not even in school because they're spending the bulk of their days gathering water. It, it just all of a sudden healthiness in the community. Education becomes an, an opportunity. You know, healthcare just skyrockets because the base layer of water, which is needed for every other building block to move a community out of poverty for good, is taken care of. So it is that most literally the most important thing in community development. What are some of the firsthand experiences that you've had working with Team World Vision? What are some things that you've seen? And can you paint a picture of what it's really like out there? Yeah. On one, you know, one particular uh, trip, I knew on this trip I was going to meet with World Vision. One of the one of the key things that we do within World Vision that activates people is, you know, not only raising money for clean water, but then putting a face with it as well. So child sponsorship is a big part of who we are and has been ever since our inception in 1950. You know, so this opportunity for someone like me, a person in the West, to have a, you know, a, a friendship, a relationship with, with a child so I can have a face to put and a name to pit with, with the need. So I was going to be meeting one of our World Vision sponsored children. Her name happens to be Winnie. I was going to be meeting her and her family for the first time. Prior to meeting Winnie, and I can tell you a little bit more about Winnie if you'd like, there's just a, a few fascinating things about that. Prior to meeting Winnie, uh, we were just strolling through a little bit on some of the very undeveloped roads in this part of Kenya near the Rift Valley area. And I noticed a girl off in the distance dropping a very small little, you know, what probably was a one gallon container down into a, what looked to be a pretty hand dug short, it's called a shallow well. And uh, we just stopped the, the land cruiser that we we're in. And I asked, is it okay if I walk over? And one of our Kenyan guides walked over with me so the little girl wasn't freaked out because, you know, I was a white guy in the middle of nowhere. And I just watched, and her name was Cherub, found out her name was Cherub, and she drew water out of this. And I looked down in this, it was a shallow well, because that can often be what happens. Folks will just dig as soon as they hit water, and that becomes their water source. And I looked in the shallow well, Trace, and I was like, oh my, I just could not believe, just seeing it, I could tell it was contaminated. And there, there was a dead frog just on the, just floating on the top of the, I could see it on the surface of the water. And I'm thinking, just something broke inside of me. And that was one small introduction. And then a little bit later that day, we we did meet Winnie and met her family. We met near their a very, very humble home, a uh, hut. And then we walked one mile to the water source that Winnie and her family draw out of. And it was that trip to that water source that opened my eyes like you wouldn't believe. Well, tell us about that. What did you see? Well, I mean, it really was like a small pond. It might remind you like when, when in the summertime as we're driving around and you're on the interstate and you kind of see these little small ponds off to the side of the road where there's might be livestock drinking out of, you know, and you, you see them all the time. Very small. And we got there and stood. I kind of stood at the edge of it. And Justina is Winnie's mother's name. And Justina went with us and with Winnie. And uh, as we stood there, I asked Justina, I said, I, I was just thinking through my head, I'm going, and again, I'm fairly new in my understanding of some of this stuff. And I and I, so I just asked her, I said, Justina, where do you all wash your clothes? Because I'm thinking, where are clothes washed in this whole setting? And she said, oh, we wash them right here. I'm kind of going, wow, okay. So clothes are being washed in the same water source. And then I asked them where they bathe. And of course, that's, again, it, it, it's just, it is their available water source. And then I, I looked around the perimeter of this little pond trace, and there were a few livestock that were drinking. And they were relieving themselves. And I was thinking, oh, my goodness. And then so Winnie and I then went out on this little, little, uh, almost like a little inlet. And we put, she had a small little jug when he was eight at the time. And she had a little jug and I had a five gallon jug. And I put mine in just to share the experience of what happens with this. And it filled and I knew the statistics. I knew it that half of the kids under the age of five in Winnie's village would die because of that water. I mean, you know, diarrhea is the most common outgrowth of contaminated water. And obviously when diarrhea sets in, then, you know, the, the, the whole thing goes south. So maybe, man, half the kids under the age of five are going to die. And so the water flows into my jug. And then I did what they do every day, three times a day. I carried it back to their home one mile back. And, you know, I'm just not in the pattern of carrying five gallon water jugs. They weigh 50 pounds. And that one mile walk back to Winnie's little home just wrecked me. 
it, for one, it was hard. I mean, I'm like, I'm like, I was in fairly decent shape, but, and she and her mother, just Justina does this three times a day. Winnie was doing this, you know, three times a day. And I'm thinking, I almost was in despair thinking about Winnie and the thousands of kids like her. And then I was reminded about what we do, what we kind of motivate people to do within our part of World Vision is to invite people to put one foot in front of the other, you know, through a race or through a walk. And by that, bring clean drinking water to children like Winnie. And so the thought formed in my head, oh my goodness, if I can just devote myself to inviting others to put one foot in front of the other, they can create a whole new future for children like Winnie and like literally, literally tens of thousands of kids like her. So while I was filled with despair, I was also filled with hope. Well, you're referring to the 6K that World Vision does every single year. Why is it a 6K? I've heard of a 5K. Why a 6K? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, So 6K actually is the average distance that women and children like Winnie and Justina walk in the developing world. So it's like 3.87 miles for those of you that are already putting this into Google to see how far a 6K is. So it's the average distance. And so we, we kind of identified that within World Vision when we started the 6K, uh, which hasn't been that many years ago, uh, 2015, I think was our first year that we did the 6K. We identified that because we wanted to raise awareness by the distance itself to that. And what's really interesting is when, when, when somebody thinks through, well, what if I were to do that distance, not just once a day, what, what we have, obviously there's plenty of women and children who are doing this three times a day in the developing world. It's the average distance. What so means that you got many who are doing it again, multiple times a day. And you're, you just kind of start rocking your world because of the time that it takes. And, and then of course, what gets deleted from a child's life, if they are doing this again, school is a big deal. There's a lot that happens on the water walk, um, you know, uh, uh, child trafficking, you know, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of bad stuff that can be happening and that type of distance is, you know, covered each day. So anyways, the 6K is just that it's, a, it's almost a distance of solidarity, if you will. Last year, I participated in my first 6K. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you, Trace. <laughs> we had the orange uniforms. My, my lovely bride and I went to our, our park that's right down the street from where we live. Uh, we had pictures of the two children that we were sponsoring. And we are not runners, racers by any stretch of the imagination, but we had the absolute worst times imaginable doing the 6K because so many people were asking us, what are you running for? What's on your shirt? Tell us about what's going on. And I bet you 20 people we had conversations with. It was fantastic. Yeah, it's really cool. We call it the bib that matters most. Um, And you nailed it. Some people think, oh my, it's the 6K. I've got, I've got to be like a runner. I've got to, and absolutely not. Just because you all are listening to me and because I happen to have run across the United States, that isn't like what the 6K. The 6K is all about every, anybody can do the 6K. Whether you, people do run it, tons of people walk it. Um, I did it, I think in 2017, I did the 6K with a 78 year old woman. She did it with her walker. I did, I did it with her. And this one, not that you need to do this, but we have people that will do fundraising. Uh, you know, uh, you, 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 the, the entrance is $50. You get a jersey, like Trace has mentioned, and you get that bib. And your $50 provides clean drinking water for that child. So that's one of the cool things with World Vision. We're the largest non-governmental provider of clean drinking water on the planet. So other than governments, we are providing more clean drinking water in developing countries. And what we've isolated it to on average, so it's $50 is what it takes to bring clean drinking water to one person. So the entrance to do the 6K is $50, but that $50 brings that clean water to one child that you have. And it's that bib that you have as that pictorial reminder, like you said, Trace, which is so super cool because it makes it super personal. And if an individual wants to fundraise beyond that, they can. Uh, They're certainly welcome to. This particular 78-year-old woman, she was just like, seized by the vision is all I can say. She ended up raising $7,800. I was so inspired walking alongside her with her walker, like going, all right, I, there's not too many people that can now throw me an excuse. Oh, I couldn't do the six game. Oh, you probably can. <laughs> well, let me ask you about the $50. How does $50 bring clean water to one child? 
Yeah. So with our work, one of the things that we love is that we will talk about the, the work that we do in the countries that we, we work in. We want to be both comprehensive and obviously sustainable. And obviously I'm talking to the scale of nation. I'm talking to the, the experts here. You know, but in the developing world, you know, within a country, there's different methods, you know, for bringing clean water. You know, obviously we think of borehole wells. Some of the most common method is, is the borehole well. And again, depending on the topography, you know, of the region, depending on where that water table is, yeah, borehole well could work and other places that may not work. So then we have to flip to perhaps, you know, a water reservoir or, and, and, and you know, you all know, and it's a, called a water pan, which is basically kind of a dam or a reservoir. There's obviously natural spring-fed wells that can be done, certainly solar-powered paneled wells. I mean, some of the most impressive projects, again, that I've seen are just full-on pipeline systems that are done and all like hand-carried pipes up sides of mountains, if you will, that bring, you know, I mean, brings fresh, clean water to like thousands of individuals. So there's this gradation of full-on pipeline systems to borehole wells to water pans. So the, with, with, with World Vision, that aggregate, you know, depending on where the water systems or what they are, the aggregate average is $50 to do that, depending on what the system is in the particular country. So again, it's just fascinating. And then, I mean, the super fascinating part is not just in the hardware of the wells or the pipelines or the dams themselves, but it's in a software of what happens within the community you know, where community members over the course of time learn how to care for their wells or care for their systems and water committees are established so that they become sustainable because that's a huge part of who we are. This is not just about, and again, the work is all done indigenously. So it's all done by indigenous Kenyans or Ethiopians, not, you know, Westerners coming in and doing the work, but how do you keep that sustainable for 10 and 20 and 30 years? So that software part of the training that we do within the communities is also just completely fascinating as well. Well, you have to tell us about that. Well, I mean, what happens, so one thing is with World Vision, when how we, we go about our work is, let's just take the country for Kenya, for example. We divide Kenya or divide a country into smaller chunks. We call them area programs, APs. And think of it maybe the size of two to three U.S. counties in size. And so we'll take, in, in a particular AP, We'll then, uh, for example, in Kenya, we have about 40 to 45 full-time Kenyan graduate level water engineers. Come WASH, water sanitation and hygiene. Our WASH engineers will then look and say, okay, what kinds of systems do we need in the country of Kenya? And, you know, as, so then as they do that, we're in that community, that, that AP, uh, we make a commitment to be in the AP for uh, 15 to 20 years. So this is a long-term relationship with that community. The first couple of years is all trust building with the tribal leaders, the church leaders, the community leaders, find out their biggest needs. And then they're involved in the process so that from the very beginning, so after the opening couple of years of trust building, then it's implementation of some of the core things. Usually it's water at first, later becomes education, healthcare, and then microfinance type of uh, matters. And certainly in those first formative years from, from like five to 10 That's when, if they're usually, if there's not clean water, one of the first sort of community-based teams that's formed is a water committee. And once water systems are brought into the community, then how then does the community then pay for that? Because there's got to be a source of revenue for that water to continue. So there's, I mean, I mean, we're talking very, very small amounts, but people pay for their water, but it's all governed by a local water committee, if you will. And so then the training of caring for the wells or caring for the pipeline system is all done. That training and teaching is done through the system of our water engineers and the communities, leaders that have been now grown for this. And it's just fascinating when you're in a community and you stand back and you see the level of ownership taken by the community themselves for their wells or their dams or their pipeline systems. And like this is very personal to them. And it's no wonder that we have just such a, a solid track record of sustainability after 10, 20, and even, you know, 30, 35 years of water systems all across the world. And it all starts with somebody putting one foot in front of the other. Yes. 
you nailed it. You nailed it, Trace. You nailed it. I, that, that, uh, you look at a problem like this and you think, what could I ever do? It's just a drip in the ocean, if you will. But there is something we can do. It's very easy. It can be fun. It can educate other people. So we have a Scaling Up H2O webpage. We have a team. I'll give the information on how people can sign up for that if they don't have their own team already. But tell us about the process. How do you get signed up? What do you get when you get signed up? What do you have to do? What's that whole process like? It's super easy, especially with what you're doing, Trace. You've got, you've got all the information already, but it's super easy. You'll go through you know, the website that you all have. It, it all goes to our global 6K website with World Vision. You just sign up. You do, you know, pay $50. I mean, it, it, I tell you what, it'll be the best $50 that you've ever spent, I think, because you're going to be effectively changing the life of one child. And then you get a collection of that happening in a community, then it just changes everything. So, but anyways, you pay your $50, you register, you're going to get a 6K, a really cool 6K t-shirt. You're going to get a medal. Uh, you're going to get the bib that matters most, the bib of that child, of course. And then you're going to do it in community. And th- what's really fun is that this can be done... People invite friends to do it with them. They invite family members to do it with them. Obviously, obviously, there's no age restriction. People are pushing strollers with their kids. Uh, again, older people are doing this. We have host sites um, all around the country, uh, in all around the world. So you can, you know, you'll you'll find out, you know, if you're going to be doing it with a scaling up host site, or maybe there's another host site that's close to where you live. You don't have to do it with a host site. You can do it like in your neighborhood. You know, you can chart your own 6K course. We'll have some host sites that might have 400 people at them. And then we have people that are going, oh, I'm going to get my family. We're going we're gonna to do it in our community, like literally in our subdivision. Uh, or I'm going to do it in my neighborhood park. We make it so that the scalability is as, as much as you want to do it. The, the important thing, as you just said, is just like saying yes. It's Saturday, May 21st. That's when the, the, the 6K date is this year, Saturday, May 21st. And just going on that Saturday, I'm going to make a difference and impact the world. That's what I'm going to do. I'm really excited for that day to come. I'm urging all the listeners in the Scaling Up Nation to at least check it out. We did it last year. We we did team building with it. We had a a lot of great dialogue around such an important cause, something that we deal with on a regular basis, which is water. And now we're doing something to help other people with the water crisis. So thanks for sharing all of that with us. I'm so excited. I hope the people listening are excited as well. Oh yeah. And I think like doing it, I know with the, the listening audience, you're part of a, you know, a business or, or, or a team that has obviously multiple people associated with it. This is a great way to build culture within your team. We all know this to be true as we lead teams. We look for opportunities to build culture within our team. Sometimes obviously outside of what we do on a day-to-day basis, while water is your work, doing this kind of thing will build amazing culture with your team. And then as they invite people to do it with them, this will be one of those very memorable things that I think an individual and individuals can do together that is just kind of like going, we did that. <laughs> it was just, and you know, I just always encourage people to like jump in it themselves, invite some other people to do it you know, with them and maybe set some kind of an audacious goal. Like, hey, we want to get X number to do this with us, or we want to see this much raised. And, you know, and I think when we do those kinds of things, it puts us in a position of like going, you know, this is good. This is good. This is good. And Steve, I really want to thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing all this. And I am really excited for May 21st. Yeah, yeah. As am I. As am I. It'd be fun to do it. I can't wait. Knowing that there's this whole community doing is going to, it just gives me even more. I mean, obviously I'll be out there. Gives me tons of motivation. So we're a community doing it together. So thank you. Did you know that you could do so much by simply putting one foot in front of the other? I'm just amazed by that expression because who knew doing that leads to so much? Who knew that so much could be done for just $50? And who knew that wearing one of those bibs can start so many conversations? Stacy, my lovely bride, and I did this 6K last year, and we had a fantastic time. We met so many new people along the trail that we took, and we got to tell our story 
about why we were walking. We were walking because we were talking. We didn't do a lot of running. A little bit of running was involved, but this was all about telling the story, having fun, getting the message out there. Now, we also did this with the Rising Tide Mastermind. Several of us made sure that we registered and we weren't physically together, but we were definitely together in spirit. We were all posting pictures of each other and we were sharing the stories that we were sharing, the experiences that we were having, and we just had a great time with it. In fact, some of the members of the Rising Tide Mastermind actually carried five gallon pails to represent the journey that Steve described. So imagine carrying that 50 pound, almost 50 pound jug along that 6K journey. Nation, we can do something about this and we can do this. We can do this 6K and we can bring awareness to this issue. We can do something about this issue and we can participate as a community while we're doing all of those things. I urge you to go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash 6K and join Team Scaling Up Nation. The 6K is going to be on May 21st, and we are hoping to get the entire Scaling Up Nation involved. Or maybe you want to join as your company or your team. That's fine. Just go out there and do it. Just put one foot in front of the other and share this story. Again, that's going to be on May 21st. And we're going to be sharing pictures via hashtag ScalingUpH2O and hashtag World Vision. If you are getting our social media posts, you know that we are letting you know everything we can about Team World Vision this year and how you can get involved with the 6K with the Scaling Up Nation. Again, just so amazed what you can do in just six kilometers for just $50 and just sharing the story. I'm also amazed at how sharing this story creates a ripple effect. You will tell somebody, somebody else will tell somebody they know, and so on. And that's how movements start. So whether you are pushing a stroller, pushing a walker, or setting your lifetime record as a runner, get out there, register, and help us all put an end to this crisis. Nation, I can't wait to hear what you are doing to spread this message, and I can't wait to run with you on May 21st. And until then, I hope you have a great week until I bring you a brand new episode next week. Take care, everybody. Scout Up Nation, so many people that I talk to want to join the Rising Tide Mastermind but they're concerned about being able to commit one hour a week for the mastermind calls. Folks, I have to tell you, when you experience that hour, you realize that that is the power hour that changes every other hour that you will experience that week. If we keep doing the same things, we will keep doing the same results. And that one hour a week allows you to get out of the day-to-day so you can work on your day-to-day. Do something different. Find out about the Rising Tide Mastermind by going to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind.